grace and peace to you in the name of Jesus Christ, and welcome to worship at First Presbyterian Church of Wilmette on this fourth Sunday in Lent. Wherever you are right now, whether near or far, we're so glad you've chosen to spend this sacred time with us as we together worship God and lean into scripture and song and prayer and listening and contemplation and action. We're grateful that you are here virtually with us worshiping today, and we're grateful that very soon we'll have the opportunity to gather in person again and, and be hybrid in our worship experience. This week in particular, we're mindful of the fact that it was a year ago exactly this week that the pandemic really hit Chicago land and really across the country as the wave of closures occurred, the stay-at-home order, and we too here at FPCW canceled our tower benefit and pivoted to online worship as best as we could overnight. What a year it has been with so much pain and suffering and disorientation and also so much beauty and goodness and resilience and hope. Thank you, friends, for sticking together, for being the body of Christ in this time and place. God is indeed still with us and at work to bring about good. If you're new to our community of faith, we want to extend an especially warm welcome to you and encourage you to get to know us by visiting our website, fpcw.org, our Facebook page. Uh, by reaching out to us, you're welcome to email me, Pastor Jeff. I'd love to hear from you. Uh, friends, know that we're grateful to have you with us as we together worship God. Please join with me in the responsive call to worship. We have started down a road that will take us to the cross. It is a journey we take together and a journey each makes alone. We are invited to notice things along the way, to notice the sharp stones, the uneven ground, the mercy of shade, the faithfulness of those who walk with us. We carry little with us, but that which is in our hearts. Hope, trust, fear, apprehension, wonder, sorrow. On this walk, we rest and sing and pray and listen. In our worship, we rest and sing and pray and listen. Friends, let us worship God, tender and just. God is calling through the whisper of the Spirit's deepest sighs. can catch us by surprise. Flash of lightning, crash of thunder, hush of stillness, rush of wonder. God is calling, can you hear? God is calling, gracious and merciful and knows our needs before they even reach our lips. Still, we engage in confession, admitting to God all that rests uneasily in our hearts. Confident of God's love, let us make our confession together, first in silent prayer.
Holy God, giver of life and forgiver of sin, we come to you now with hope. Hope that you will always love us. Hope that you will not hold our sin against us. Hope that you will turn us around from what is evil towards what is good. Walk with us in this holy season and help us to look clearly at our lives and the world, broken and beautiful as it is, that we may embrace all people and all things with love. Through Christ, the one who goes before us, we pray, amen. Friends, God is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. The first and the last word with God is grace, grace to heal and make new, grace to propel us forward. This is the good news of the gospel. Thanks to God. Amen. Change my heart. And now, friends, may the peace of Christ be with you and also with you. I encourage you to share the peace of Christ right now with people in your household. If you're worshiping together or uh, to shoot a text, send an email, make a phone call to someone in our congregation or beyond, um, wishing them God's love, God's peace, God's hope in these days. A few announcements to draw your attention to. Our Lenten focus is the way to Shalom, a Lenten journey of peace and wholeness. And we've been working our way through various aspects of Shalom. We had a good annual meeting last Sunday via Zoom at 11 a.m. It was great to see so many faces in that virtual space, uh, voting on various business matters from our congregation. But we also had a chance to watch a, a video montage of of pictures and screenshots of our ministry together in the past year. It's on our YouTube channel and in the email we sent out uh, with the worship service uh, today, if you care to watch that. A reminder that our women's retreat is scheduled for next weekend, and it will have Reverend Holly Whitcomb as our speaker. She's written an excellent book that a number of our small groups are reading, The Seven Spiritual Gifts of Waiting. Uh, the retreat will be Friday and Saturday over Zoom, March 19th and 20th. Uh, information about how to register is, is in various communications of our church. We are leading closer and closer to Easter and Holy Week, those sacred days for our faith. Uh, we're excited to share that our plan is to have an outdoor Easter worship service on April 4th, uh, Sunday morning at, at 10 a.m. They'll be masked and distanced and a, a short service, probably about 15 minutes in length. We will still have a pre-recorded Easter worship service like this one for anyone to watch at, at home or at your convenience. Uh, but would love to have you join us in person if you're so inclined and, and able to do so. We'll also have a short fellowship time after that with some simple sweet and savory treats, uh, again, masked and distanced here in the, the church parking lot. So if you're in town and if you're willing and able, we'd love to see you in person on Easter. If not, uh, we'd love to connect with you in this virtual worship space. Friends, just a reminder to continue to reach out to one another, be in prayer for one another, experience God in creation, and know that you are loved and never alone. Our first scripture reading today comes from the book of Psalms, chapter 27, verses 1 through 4 and 13 through 14. 
The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When evildoers assail me to devour my flesh, my adversaries and my foes, they shall stumble and fall. Though an army encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war rise against me, yet I shall be confident. One thing I asked of the Lord, this will I seek after, to live in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire at his temple. I believe that I shall see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord, be strong, and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. Our second scripture reading comes from the book of Romans, chapter 8, verses 22 through 28. We know that the whole creation has been groaning in labor pains until now, and not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly while we wait for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. For in hope we are saved. Now, hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what is seen? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we ought, but that very Spirit intercedes with sighs too deep for words. And God, who searches the heart, knows what is in the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. We know that all things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Today, we continue our Lenten sermon series, The Way to Shalom, A Journey of Peace and Wholeness. Each week in Lent, we've been focusing on a different aspect of shalom, the Hebrew word that means holistic well-being and universal flourishing, not just for ourselves, of course, but also for our neighbors, indeed, for all of God's creation. The past three weeks, we've zeroed in on various aspects of shalom, justice and peace, last week on healing. Today, we zero in on the aspect of hope. Sometimes in the church, we use words that are foreign to our culture or to the rest of our lives, words like justification or eschatology or sin or transubstantiation, I mean, we don't often turn to our work colleague and say, so how's your view of uh, eschatology working out these days? The challenge with these kind of words, like sin, eschatology, and so on, is that they're less familiar and require a bit more translation. But in the church, we also use words that are very popular in our culture, whether they have a Christian origin or not, words like love, forgiveness, peace, and healing. But the challenge with these more familiar words is the fact that they're, they're so familiar and contain so many meanings that it can be difficult to reclaim the core of their Christian meaning. Hope is a word like that, a word that's exceedingly familiar and flexible. I mean, we can have hope for rather mundane things like I hope the sun is out tomorrow, or I hope alchemy isn't out of my favorite scone today, or I hope this strong coffee wakes me up after a rough night of sleep. But we can also hope for things that are serious and holy, things like I hope my cancer goes into remission, or I hope I can find a new job in this difficult economic environment, or I hope I can reconcile with this person from whom I am estranged, or I hope we can eliminate the sins of racism and poverty and hunger and homelessness in our community. 
Hope is a, a high-stakes word, and yet it also rolls off the tongue in these ordinary moments. The word love is that way too, right? We can say, I love cheering for the Cubs, or I love the ice cream at Hardigan's or Homer's, or we can also say, I love my spouse, or I love my parents, or I love my children, all the same word, but completely different meanings. So when we speak of Christian hope, we do mean something in particular. Our scripture lesson from chapter 8 of Paul's letter to the Romans gets right to the heart of it. For Paul, hope is both a present and future reality. We experience glimpses of it now, but it hasn't yet been fully realized. You and I were living in the in-between times, between God's promise and its fulfillment. Paul says it's like we're experiencing labor pains as a pregnant woman does. A little bit of mansplaining there, perhaps, on Paul's part. But anyway, his point is that right now there is pain and suffering, contraction after contraction, but that this momentary pain and suffering isn't the end of the story. For the protracted labor is all in service of what's to come. The joy and relief at the birth of a child, literally new creation, a symbol of hope. Perhaps you remember your own experience giving birth or witnessing it. The birth of our three children, Eden, Simon, and Noah, were holy and unforgettable moments for me. Ariane's grit and resilience was amazing. I mean, I didn't even do any of the work and felt none of the pain, and yet I was still exhausted when each of our children arrived. I did the best I could to encourage and support Arianne, but what ultimately kept her going was knowing what was coming. Each contraction, each position change, each breath, really, brought us one step closer to meeting our little one. That's what hope is like. It's not necessarily something we can point to in particular detail or fully experience right now. As Paul says, hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what one sees? We may have glimpses of it now again, but we don't see the whole picture. Hope is more of a meta-narrative, a lens through which we see the world and indeed all of history. The Christian hope assures us that the world is going somewhere, and going somewhere good. It's beginning to crescendo ever so incrementally, culminating into that vision of universal shalom and flourishing that has always been God's dream. But there's a temptation that has crept in here for many Christians, especially those of us who are white and fairly well off, we have sometimes assumed we couldn't change the status quo, the enslavement of entire races, the subjugation of women, endless wars, economic inequality, hunger and homelessness, these things that break God's heart in our world. At times we just assume these are just the unfortunate reality of a broken and fallen world. And in so doing, sometimes we abdicated our responsibility and just succumbed to hopelessness, assuming things will never change until Jesus returns to set the world to rights. This kind of posture is like that song by John Mayer, maybe you've heard it, where he keeps singing, we keep on waiting, we keep on waiting for the world to change. My friends, that kind of passive acceptance of the way the world is, is, is not the Christian way an indifference of sorts to the world as it has come to be. No, the, the Christian way has always been one of partnering with God to transform the world from how it is into the world as it could be, indeed, as it one day will be. As we pray in the Lord's Prayer every Sunday, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven which is another way of saying, God, use me to make your dream for the world, namely heaven, your will, 
use me to use use me to, to embody that that dream of yours heaven make it more of a reality in the here and now right here on earth in other words to pull heaven down to earth and so we affirm with the apostle paul that god's future hope is right here and right now breaking into the present moment through our very words and actions through our decisions to love our neighbor even our enemy and to be a conduit for god's love into the world these very things we do small minute decisions as they are make a concrete difference every day and yet as christians we also recognize the full realization of god's hope is still off in the distance as paul says in our scripture lesson for today we all groan inwardly as we await the full realization of god's hope and promise it's a good reminder that it's it's okay to groan it's okay to lament it's okay to name the world as it is and to let it break our hearts as it breaks god's heart we groan because we acutely feel the gap between the world as it is and the world as it ought to be and so we we do groan we do yearn for the world to reach its potential and we also hope and so we groan and we hope we groan and we hope that's where you and i live our lives on the way to shalom as our lenten theme puts it now i realize we all get impatient i certainly do the world has been on this path a long time and just think about the pandemic we're still living through but hopefully about to emerge out of sometimes it feels like we're not making any progress in fact we've jumped a couple steps back it's often incremental and there is a, a sense in which there's two steps forward and five steps back and three steps to the side and you get the idea the journey toward this dream of god's this vision of ultimate hope it can be a lonely journey it can be a circuitous journey it can be littered with more obstacles than we'd ever imagined but our call friends is to stay on the path to put one foot in front of the other to do the next right thing to remain people of hope even as we groan <laughs> because we know what the end of the story looks like and we know we're not there yet but we will be someday think about it this way you and i and all creation are like a beloved old house the house is still standing but it needs major work the foundation is cracked the floors and walls need an overhaul but god has decided to launch into a meticulous floor to ceiling renovation of every nook and cranny of this beloved old house every pipe and wire redone fixing the foundation redoing the kitchen pulling up the worn out carpet adding a room here knocking out a wall there bringing the house back to its former glory making it shine even brighter than it ever has before one challenge though if you're like me is sometimes you get hope confused with its distant cousin optimism a quote from Miroslav Volf, the Croatian theologian and professor at Yale, really helped me with this a few years ago when I stumbled on it. He writes, Hope is very different from optimism. Optimism is based on the possibilities of things as they have come to be. Hope, on the other hand, is based on the possibilities of God, irrespective of how things are. Hope, Wolf writes, can spring up even in the valley of the shadow of death. Hope comes from beyond us and is grounded not in our circumstances merely, but in God, God's promise, God's goodness, God's power. Back in seminary, one of my professors in church history, church history excuse me, assign portions of dante's inferno for us to read maybe some of you had to read that growing up in college or uh, perhaps in graduate school i remember reading K 
Canto 3, which is pretty far into the uh, Inferno, and it's the section where Dante arrives at the gates of hell and notices the unnerving inscription placed above the door. It warns all people who pass through it, Abandon every hope, all you who enter here. For Dante, hell is a place with no hope. Enter hell in this life or the next, and hope is gone. This is often what utter crippling despair feels like. Like there is just no path forward, no hope for tomorrow. I think I've told this story before of Rabbi Hugo Grin, a Holocaust survivor who was at Auschwitz with his father. He vividly remembers one day his father dipping a bit of string in butter to light a Shabbat candle. When Hugo protested that it was the last of their butter, what is he doing? Hugo's father replied, Without food we can live for weeks, but we cannot live for a minute without hope. How true that is. Sure, we can go through the motions without hope, but to, to truly live, to share God's love with the world, to lean into the world as it could be, not just as it is. If we are to do that, we must be fueled by something much bigger than our circumstances, by God's vision of hope. Brian Stevenson is a lawyer, activist, and professor who has worked tirelessly to reform our broken criminal justice system here in the U.S., especially working with those serving on death row. Stevenson also recently opened the National Memorial for Peace and Justice in Montgomery, Alabama, which honors the names of the more than 4,000 black Americans who were lynched in the American South from the late 19th century to the mid 20th century. He's a remarkable human being. His book, his book Just Mercy, and the film is based on it now, is well worth your time. I encourage you to pick it up. But he said something in an interview last year that about hope that, that really has stuck with me and has been working on me ever since. I want to share it with you too. In this interview, he said, I am persuaded that hopelessness is the enemy of justice. If we allow ourselves to become hopeless, Stevenson said, we become part of the problem. I think you're either hopeful or you're the problem. There's no neutral place. We've been dealing with injustice in so many places for so long. And if you try to dissect why this injustice is still here, it's because people haven't had enough hope and confidence to believe that we can do something better. I think hope is our superpower. Hope is the thing that gets you to stand up when others say, sit down. It's the thing that gets you to speak when others say, be quiet. Hope is our superpower. When I first heard that on a podcast interview, I thought, now that'll preach. So here I am trying today. Hope is our superpower, friends. Stevenson, of course, didn't just mean it for preachers. He meant it for all of us. Created in God's image as we all are, we are hardwired for hope. By the way, not a hunky-dory, pie-in-the-sky, everything's-going-to-be-all-right kind of hope, but a sturdy and generous and wide-ranging hope, a hope grounded in God's dream in a world that God will never stop loving and never stop saving until that dream is finally fully realized. Hope can be our super superpower, friends, as we work to support racial justice when it seems like the scale and history of the problems is overwhelming. Hope can be our superpower as we work to tackle hunger and homelessness, loneliness and mental illness, addiction and domestic violence. Hope can be our superpower as we strive to deepen our experience of God practicing self-compassion and non-judgmental curiosity toward our family, our friends, our neighbors, our co-workers, to love them as God loves them. Hope can be our superpower as we wonder about how the world is going to emerge from this deadly pandemic. 
with all the pain and suffering, grief and loss, widening inequalities, political polarization we now face. Hope can be our superpower if we let it. As the Apostle Paul wrote to the nascent church in Rome, the capital of the empire, some 50, some time in the mid-50s, excuse me, of the first century, as Paul wrote to them, we, we inwardly groan and we outwardly hope. But we can't merely hope for what we see, merely hope in our circumstances. It must go beyond that. At the very end of the letter, in chapter 15 of Romans, Paul returns to the theme of hope and charges the church in Rome with these words. He tells them, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Friends, our hope today, tomorrow, this Lent, and always, our hope is grounded in God, the God of hope, who offers abundant hope to us by the power of the Holy Spirit. May that hope be our fuel, our superpower, as we partner with God in the here and now to pull heaven down to earth one moment at a time. In the name of our God, who is light, and life and love. Amen. Living to hope of captives freed, of sight regained the end of greed, the oppressed shall be The year of God's own jubilee. Live in to hope the blind shall see with insight and with clarity, removing shades of pride and fear, a vision of of our God brought near. Live in to hope of captives freed from chains of fear or want or creed. God now proclaims our full release to faith and Our pastoral prayer today will include a sung response. In just a moment, Peggy will teach it for all of us. She'll do that by singing it through twice, so you have a chance to hear it and start to learn it if you don't know it already. During the spoken prayer, when it is time for the sung response, I will raise my hand, step aside, and put my mask back on while Peggy sings and you are invited to join in that response with her. And please know that you are invited wherever you are to sing along, to hum along, or simply dwell in the music, in your mind, heart, and spirit. All is part of how we pray and sing before our God.
Let us now join together in this time of praying with and for one another. O oh God, our Creator, we come before you now with prayers for the world, the Church, our loved ones, and ourselves. You have said that even when we don't know how or what to pray, your Spirit intercedes on our behalf. May all of our praying be part of that ongoing and all-knowing prayer of your Spirit. The Spirit intercedes for us with sighs too deep for words to express. God of grace, as we continue on our Lenten road toward true shalom, we pray for peace in a world of trials, for hope in a world of despair, for guidance in a world that is often lost. We remember all those who are striving for peace and justice in their lands. We pray for elected leaders, for volunteers, for citizens of every age who continue their work in nations that have been torn apart by war, in communities that are in the midst of conflict, in the places we live that are all weary from the pandemic. The Spirit intercedes for us with sighs to deep. Spirit of hope, we ask for your love and peace among us, in our homes, and in our relationships. We pray for your vision to replace our own, so that we may see with eyes of faith and hope. We pray that your love and mercy will be seen in us and lived out through us. Lord of wholeness, we remember before you all those who are hurting this day, for those known to us, those among us, and those known only to you, who are grieving a loss, who are in the hospital, those who are recovering from illness or injury. Hear the prayers of our hearts, joined together in this virtual space, and community of faith. Spirit intercedes for us with sighs too deep for words to express. Lord of our lives, we pray in trust and in confidence that you are eternally with us beside us and before us. And we continue to pray as Jesus taught, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever amen in this season of lent we are invited to participate in god's kingdom emerging all around us may we offer ourselves to god with glad and generous hearts freely giving our tithes and offerings to the ministry of this congregation. In lieu of passing the plate, we invite you to give through our church website, our smartphone app, by texting the word WILLMET to the number 77977, or by sending a check to the church office. 
As we gather our gifts together and offer them to God, may we do so in gratitude and praise. Let us bow together in prayer. God of all mercy and abundance, we thank you for these gifts and promise to use them to the best of our abilities as we follow you on this Lenten path. Through the power of your spirit, may these gifts be used to bring renewal and hope to those who need it most. Amen. Dios de la esperanza, danos gozo y paz, al mundo en crisis habla tu verdad. Dios de la justicia, mandanos tu luz, luz y in the obscurity, oremos por la paz, cantemos de tu amor, luchemos por la paz, fieles a ti, Señor. May the God of hope go with us every day. superpower. May we find ways this day, tomorrow, and in the week and weeks to come to share God's hope with the world. In the name of our God, who is light and life and love and liberation, be with you now and always. Amen. <laughs> Thank you. 